Hello friends, welcome back to my Roll20 Crash Course. This is part one in which you get into the overview of the system. Roll20 is a virtual tabletop. So this series is designed for anybody that's uh, new to Roll20 or maybe wanting to migrate their, their game to online play and not wanting to spend the hours that I spent learning it the hard way. You just want something you can watch in the weekend and get it ready, this is for you. Uh, so when you first load into Roll20, um, this is kind of what it looks like. You get it, get up set, uh, set up with a free account. And um, I am going to load up a game that I've already created. However, I do want to show you what it will look like to create a new game. Because um, there is a very important thing to note here on the Create New Game screen. Um, this is where you're going to name your game. Um, you can select from a number of different built-in character sheets. I don't personally use this. All my players use D&D uh, &D Beyond for character sheets. But... If you want to keep everything self-contained, D D Beyond, sorry, uh, Roll20 has, has the hookup, has you uh, all set up here. You can use the default uh, 5e character sheet, but maybe you're not playing D D 5e. They've got uh, tons of different systems uh, and character sheets pre-made, built into Roll20 that you can use. Um, even some older systems, but I'm going to keep it on the default D&D uh, &D 5th edition which is somewhere near the top. Here we go. Um, also, this is the most important thing to note. If you've ever purchased, if you purchased a module on Roll20, um, let's say like myself, I was running uh, Ice, uh, Icewind Dale, Rhyme of the Frostmaiden. I purchased this on Roll20 and then it took me uh, a while to figure out why I couldn't get this module onto my game. You have to select it here before you say create game. This is the last and only point that you can, that you have to add a module to your game. You can't add it to an existing game, has to be done right here because this is gonna give you all the pages and tokens and pre-built settings for your game. So note that, but I'm not gonna do that. We're gonna go back out into my own games and load up the Rule 20 Crash Course, which I have nothing put in here so far because I wanna start it from scratch. Um, but one thing to note before this actually loads, I'm using an add-on called VTT Enhancement Suite. Uh, it's, I know that it's available for Firefox. It's probably available for uh, Chrome as well. Um, just makes things a little prettier and uh, keeps things better organized. Um, so we've got some toolbars. We've, we've loaded into a gridded map of sorts. Default is, the way that I have this set up, um, I can right click and hold and move around the map like this. And, or, and with, scroll mount, with the scroll wheel, it's set up to zoom. Um, you can change that in settings. We're going to go into that in a second. On the right-hand side of the screen are all your different categories of things that you're going to interact with. On the left-hand side is your toolbar, and bottom left is the different layers that Rule20 has access to. I'm going to cover this first, and then every future video in the series will kind of get into using this separately. So, um, as you can imagine, uh, this is sort of like every photo editing program you've ever used where things are on different layers because maybe you don't want to interact with that particular thing. Um, in the case of we're playing fifth edition D and D or any, any, uh, tabletop role-playing game, you've got things that you don't want your characters to your, your player characters to interact with, but maybe you want them to see it stuff like the actual uh, map that they're on, uh, different assets on the map. You don't want them to be moving around furniture and trees and stuff. Maybe there's some pillars and columns and beams that you do want them to mess around with. Maybe there's some doors that you set up to physically be able to, to, uh, to open. You, you want them to be able to move their own token, uh, of course. So you've got things that you want them to see and interact with and not interact with. And there's things that you want nothing, nobody to interact with. And maybe there's things that you only you want to see uh, and not your players. So we've got these different layers to differentiate and distinguish each one of those. Tokens. Just what it says for it's for all your player character tokens anything you want a player to interact with can go here uh our gm layer is for anything that we want secret and private just for us to see uh so for instance that's things like uh notes on the map to yourself hey don't forget there's a trap here at dc 15 um or hey don't forget there's a hidden door right here it's not for your players it's just for you it's notes to yourself um our dynamic lighting We'll get into that when we start making some maps. It's for making things look pretty and interactive so that your player tokens move around and the lighting changes. Um, and then our map, of course, is for everything that we want to put on the map layer. It's for things that you want players to see but not be able to interact with. Uh, by default, it starts at tokens, so that's where we are also going to start. So back to the top right, we have our chat. 
and it's got some handy dandy chat tips here. Uh, if you do want to communicate with your players via this, I use uh, Discord for all this stuff, but you can keep it all self-contained and uh, do all your commands and chatting through Roll20, and there's a number of tips here. Um, Roll20 also has a really handy uh, Wikipedia page, so if you ever, anything that's not covered in here, you can find in the Wikipedia for sure. Um, so our chat, we've got our art library. This is where all the assets that you ever upload can go. And what's great about this, what's really great about this is this is shared across campaigns. So I used to use this quite a bit in the beginning. I, I mostly keep myself organized offline on my own PC these days, but if you want to keep it online, um, you can do so. You might want to be careful because with the free roll 20 account, the file size is kind of limited. Um, but you can, it's shared across campaigns so you can start to set up your own uh database of sorts and say well, okay i i know i might not have uh images that i want to use across campaigns but there's some things some assets that certainly would be useful um i can make some folders and upload those assets then no matter what campaign i'm in i'm going to have access to it so for instance i made myself some number tokens um so w whenever I, I have a custom map that i'm throwing on here and i i don't want to uh you know, have to remember what every single area is. I'll just drag this onto the map and then write the corresponding paragraph in my notes, like a like an official module does. Uh, I use that same style and it works pretty well. Uh, we'll get into how to make these tokens in a future video. Next, up at the top, we have our journal. This is uh, anything that you want to uh, send to players and you can send it to all your players or uh, just send it to certain players. They have their own journal. You make a thing and you put it in there and you say, okay, everyone now can see this or uh, player that picked up that secret note, check your journal. You can see what it is. No other player can, uh, that sort of stuff. Could just be a handout, could be a picture, could be a number of things. We'll maybe get into this a little bit in tokens and maps, perhaps. Our compendium, every account on Roll20 comes with a free set of the basic 5th edition rules. And you can search this if you're ever in the middle of the game and you're like, where's my player's handbook? I don't want to have to go digging. I don't want to go into, um, you know, D&D Beyond or something else to look up a rule. Quick, I don't remember exactly how, uh, what, what, what's the actual ruling of uh, Counterspell? And you can search through here and click it. And uh, now you've got the rules for Counterspell. Or what I use quite a bit is conditions. Because I'm never really sure exactly how those, uh, you know, restrain and, and, and whatnot conditions work. So you can search conditions, pull this up. You can even have this just, uh, if you double click any of these menus, it should minimize it. Um, and now you've got it at your disposal just all the time. Um, maybe you even want to just pull this off onto a different monitor or something. Um, by default, any of these pop-ups are contained to the actual window, but you can click, uh, set it up in its own window. You can click it, now drag it off screen, and now you've got it ready to go. You don't have to spend a couple of minutes looking it up in your in your uh, player's handbook or searching through D&D uh, Beyond. You've got it right here. So anything that is in the basic rules automatically comes with Roll20. Super nice. Next, we've got our jukebox. This is for music. We'll get into that in a later video. Um, we've got collection. I don't particularly use this ever. This is for making your own macros, um, rollable tables, playing cards, that sort of stuff. I don't ever really use this. Um, so if, if this is something that interests you, you'll have to go do your own research. This is not, not going to be covered in this video series. Lastly is our settings. Um, one thing that I would do right away, uh, because I don't use, um, roll 20 for video or for voice. Um, I come into, into here whenever I'm making a new campaign and I go to personalization and display. I change the display name to be whatever I want it to be. Um, whatever I type in here is what's going to be displayed down here, as well as when I type into chat. Uh, what's going to be displayed here. Let's change this back to Dungeon Master, and you can see right away that updates. And then I also, where was the last thing? I think this actually might be in audio and video. Maybe it is not. Video display, there we go. Uh, video display in the audio and video Tab. By the way, like I mentioned before, if this looks any different for you, it's because I'm rolling, I'm using um, VTT Enhancement Suite. I'm not sure what it looks like without this. Um, we can come into settings and go audio and video and change this to player video avatar size name only. Since I'm not using voice and video, I take that off completely and I go, I go names only. 
Um, so that's it for settings. There's, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff in here. I'm not going to go through every single one of these, but those are just a couple that I set up right away. Uh, our tools on the left, I'm going to finish with this. And then in the next video, we'll actually get into making some stuff. Uh, so we have, uh, our settings. This is a, a settings, like quick settings for sp some specific things you might want to use. Um, they even have a dark mode now. This is nice. Um, and by the way, if this ever gets too cluttered for you, you can minimize any of these, including this sidebar here. Um, I typically keep it open because I like to have everything handy. By default, our select tool, I don't really need to explain that. We've got pan. So if you're trying to um, you know, move the map up and down, left to right, you can click the pan tool. Um, if you wanna change the defaults on the mouse, here's another settings trick. Uh, settings, just not really a trick. We can go to keyboard shortcuts and it tells you a bunch of cool keyboard shortcuts, but the mainly the one I'm interested in here is use scroll wheel to zoom or to pan. We were talking about using this tool to pan and you can set it up so that your scroll wheel, right now I use scroll wheel to zoom. This is the easiest for me. You can set it up to pan as well. Now it goes up and down like you're scrolling in um, any internet page, for, for example. Um, however, an even better way to pan, so you don't even have to use this tool, is simply right-click and drag. So uh, I'm zoomed way in. I can just right-click and drag and move the move the uh, the map around, no matter if it's on scroll to pan or scroll to, to zoom. I believe it should work both ways. Next, our draw tool. Um, pretty self-explanatory. And I, I use this mostly when making uh, lines for our dynamic lighting. We'll get into that in a later video, but if you wanna draw some stuff too, this is a pretty uh, rudimentary and basic way. If you wanna make, uh, you just wanna sketch out a really quick map of the area, you can do that here. Um, you have to play around with it. It is kind of wonky. You've got um, outline and interior in case you're making, you know, something that has a fill shape. Um, you got line size, all that stuff. We've got text, self-explanatory. You can change the size. You can change bold, italic, and fonts if you want to. Um, lighting, we can just put down some torches, put down some doors, put down some windows that all have different functions. Again, we'll get into that in a later video. Um, we have our uh, Fog of War uh, tool, which honestly is outdated at this point. Um, it's an old system that they used to use for lighting in which you would, um, make areas hidden. And then as players progress through the dungeon or around the map, you would reveal those areas. This is outdated because their new and most uh, recent, uh, dynamic lighting enables you to uh, have the lighting be different for players based on where they are and what you set their token to be able to see. So for example, if somebody has dark vision and they're moving around, they're going to see something different, um, than somebody who doesn't. So this fog of war is outdated and I don't ever use it. The measurement tool is fairly, um, it's intuitive and it's also extremely useful. And there's some things that aren't quite obvious about it. So by default, we're going to be doing a line, which is snapped to the center of the grid. Pretty self-explanatory. Um, we can change this. So it's just a click and drag to measure. Uh, uh, this by default maps are set up to be five foot grids. So as you can see, I'm drawing, you know, 15 feet, 20, 25 feet. Um, we can set it to snap to corner. Now we're drawing corner to corner or not snap at all. And now we're just freely clicking wherever we want. Uh, we can also say we want this to fade away instantly, which is you let it go and it's gone. Linger allows it to stay on the map until you say, don't be on the map anymore. We can say uh, broadcast to others or not. If we just are doing it for ourselves, we can deselect. Uh, we can toggle broadcast to others. We can turn it on so everybody can see it. Uh, and then lastly, this is the neat thing. If you want to, um, you know, measure a more complicated path rather than just a straight line, you can click and hold and then right click while you're still holding down. And that will allow you to uh, create different paths and do an accumulation of the total distance. So for example, if I wanted to move straight, still holding down left mouse button and I right click and I want to go diagonally up here, we'll stop there. We'll come up 10 feet, turn a corner and come around the corner and stop. We can see, okay, actually that's 60 feet total. And here's the path that I took to do it. So it allows you to make these really complicated paths, but wait, there's more. So not only do we have lines, we have squares. So maybe we want to measure an area of effect that happens to be a square for some reason. We can do that. 
Uh, I don't really know many square. I, I think I think there are a few low level spells that are uh, cubes or something like that. Um, but we more frequently you might use like radius. You know, a, a area of effect that's a radius, and now you can visually draw that out. You can draw out a cone if you want to, and say, well, my my character casts a spell that uh, is a 15 foot cone. Well, I can see what a 15 foot cone looks like, and I can see who's going to get affected by it. Maybe we're drawing a beam, and it's going to be a 10 foot wide beam. And now I can see anything that's going to be hit by this 10 foot wide beam based on where my token is. Uh, so very very neat. It allows you to measure uh, area of effect as well as path distances. Um, turn order. I don't know why this is lingering. It's been doing that in my tests. Uh, turn orders. I, I do use roll 20 for tracking initiative because it's really easy to use. Um, if you set it up so that your players have control over their token, they you can add their token to the initiative and uh, they can actually go and change their initiative themselves. So gone are the days of trying to put everything in, in correct order and going, okay, uh, 20 to 25, write down, writing down the names and then putting them in the right order. You can just have players enter it in for you and then sort it. Um, and it'll, it should do it automatically, but in case it doesn't, you can do that in here. Um, and then you can cycle through the turn orders. Really nice and easy way to keep track of initiative. Lastly is our dice roller. It's got a bunch of presets. Um, so you can say, okay, well, I need to roll uh, 3d4 or 2d6 or 1d100. Fudge is for a different system. Um, and it's got all these different settings here. You can roll privately and say, I just want to roll and have only myself see. Uh, when you click any of these things, it'll, it's going to show it in the chat dialog. So if I roll 4d6 and I click GM roll, it says, yes, to GM, I'm the only one that saw this. If I deselect that and roll the same thing, now everybody can see it. These other settings, um, we've got inline dice. Uh, if you wanted to have your dice and, and not, if you want to roll dice and not show these separate values, uh, for whatever reason, I click uh, you know 4d6 again. It's going to show just the result. Um, if I hover over this now, it will show the dice rolls uh, that were actually that made up that roll. Um, and we've got exploding dice. These are for some other systems. Um, I think the way that this one works, uh, and I actually had to look up before I made this what all these things did because I never had heard exploding dice, compounding dice, penetrating dice. Um, I believe the way exploding dice works is if you roll a maximum value on a dice roll, you get to roll again and add that. And compounding dice, I believe, same thing, but it counts that as one dice roll. And penetrating dice, I believe same thing, but it subtracts one from those values. Um, so if you happen to be using a system that does that, there's all these presets. If in case you might be thinking, but wait, I want to roll a D20 with bonuses. How in the heck do I do that? I don't see a place to do that. Well, we go into advanced roller and now we can do that. We can say, I want to roll a D20 uh, and my bonus is plus four. Okay, cool. Roll the 13, probably didn't pass. Or I want to roll... Uh, two uh we'll say 3d8 plus plus two great that's how i can do this it saves recent rolls so you know you've got something common for a specific uh villain or something like that it'll save it here if you haven't set it up so that you can just have a clickable button on that token um and if for some reason you've got a target value i don't know why you'd ever need to do this in roll 20 um when you can just, you know what your target DC is and you can see if this is a bigger number or not, but maybe you've got a bunch uh, of uh, rolls to do and you need to count up the successes for whatever reason. So let's roll six D20s plus four. And let's say our target, um, we needed to hit 20. And I can say that and, so, and I'll go, okay, I rolled six D20s um, based on the numbers that I rolled. Uh, I had one success. Okay, maybe you have a system where you need to do that. This is how you do that. So uh, I think that should be it for the basic overview. In the next video, we're going to get into a little bit more nitty gritty and start creating a map. We'll talk about grids, non-grids. Uh, we'll talk about adding some custom assets and making a map that is functional as a card or a, visible re a visual representation. Um, so thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video.